Welcome back. Particle kinematics is about the geometry of the motion of particles and bodies in space. Kinematics is part of dynamics, and the other part of dynamics is kinetics. And kinetics is about the relationship between forces acting on bodies, their masses, and the resulting motions. Today we're going to focus on particle kinematics, though some of the ideas that we introduce we won't really need until we get to continuum mechanics. Now we'll consider three types of motion. A rectilinear motion, which means motions in a straight line, or essentially one-dimensional motions. Curvilinear motion, which means motions in three-dimensional space. And angular motion, which are also curvilinear motions in three-dimensional space, but represented by radii and angles. So let's start by reviewing position, displacement, and velocity. So the point P at time t is moving so that it's at point P prime at time t plus delta t. Its position at point P is denoted by the position vector capital X and at time t plus delta t by position vector little x. The displacement vector u is the difference between little x and big x, and for small displacements we'll label this delta x. Therefore, the velocity vector v is the limit as delta x tends to zero of delta x over delta t, which is dx dt, or x dot. So here's the velocity vector, which is tangent to the point of the arc of the motion at point P at time T. Now we can define acceleration. So again, at time T we have point P, at time T plus delta T, the particles at point P prime, the velocity vector at time T is V, and at time T plus delta T is V plus delta V. The position vector is little x at P, and the velocity vector is v, so the acceleration vector a is the limit as delta t tends to zero of delta v over delta t, which is dv dt, or v dot, or x double dot. So for this motion, the acceleration vector is shown in red. Note that the acceleration vector has components tangent to the motion and normal to the motion. Now, often in kinematics, we have to solve problems for velocity and displacement by integrating the, an expression for acceleration that we often solve for, and if it's a problem in kinetics, using forces. So let's consider the 1D rectilinear case where x, v, and a now reduce to scalars, the, if you like, the x component in a one-dimensional motion. So in the case when a is a function of t, then a of t is v dv dt, which means dv equals a dt. So if we want to integrate this for velocity, then the integral between v naught and v of dv would be the integral between zero and t of a of t d with respect to t. Now if a is a function of x, then again we can make use of the fact that a is equal to dv dt and v equals dx dt. And if we compute v dv and expand that using the chain rule, we would get v dv dx dx, which would be v dv dt dt dx dx. But dt dx is 1 over v, so that cancels with v leaving us dv dt, which is a dx. So integrating this, we would get that the velocity of v is the integral from v naught to v of v dv is equal to the integral from x naught to x of a of x dx. So this is when we have acceleration as a function of x. If we have acceleration as a function of v, we can do something similar. Again, we make use of the fact that dv dt is equal to a, now a function of v, 
which gives us that dv over a of v is equal to dt, and integrating that gives us that the integral from v0 to v of dv over a of v is equal to the integral from t0 to t of dt. Or alternatively, we can make use of the fact that dv dt equals dv dx times dx dt, which equals v dv dx, and integrate this to obtain that the integral from x0 to x of dx equals the integral from v0 to v of v dv over a of x. So these are some useful ways to make use of the definitions of this velocity and acceleration to integrate accelerations to obtain velocities and positions for different problems. Now let's consider a curvilinear motion and resolve the tangential and normal components of the acceleration. This requires a little bit of differential geometry and the key trick here is to and imagine to create a parameter s that you can think of of the arc length that varies continuously along the trajectory of the moving particle. We can define ds, the length of any segment along the trajectory, using Pythagoras. So ds squared equals dx1 squared plus dx2 squared plus dx3 squared, or in vector notation, dx dot dx. Therefore, ds is equal to the square root of dx dot dx. So all we really need to know is that this relationship can be found and exists. The velocity, which is dx dt, or x dot, could therefore by the chain rule be written as dx ds ds dt. Now, dx ds is the vector normalized by its length, so it's a unit vector along the tangent of the uh, motion, so that's e sub t, and ds dt is just the magnitude of the velocity component along the uh, tangent direction, so it's the magnitude of the velocity vector. Therefore, the acceleration dv dt is d dt of ds dt times the unit vector tangent vector et, which equals, therefore, by the chain rule, d2 sdt squared times e sub t plus d s d t times d e t d t. This further expands to d2 sdt squared times e t, the tangent vector, plus d s d t times d e t d s times d s d t, which therefore gives us d two s d t squared times e t plus d e t d s times d s d t squared. Now we won't prove it, but d e t d s, the derivative of the tangent vector with respect to the arc length, is actually the normal vector divided by the radius of curvature. So this gives us d2 s dt squared times et plus e n over rho times d s dt all squared. Therefore, the tangent component of the acceleration is d2 s dt squared or dv dt, where v here is the magnitude of the velocity vector, and the normal component of the acceleration is 1 over rho times ds dt squared, or the magnitude of the velocity squared divided by rho. So that gives us that the acceleration vector has tangent component, d magnitude of v dt, and normal component, magnitude of v squared over rho. So this brings us to kinetics, and unlike statics that only requires Newton's first and third laws, in dynamics we need Newton's second law. So recall that the linear momentum 
of a particle with mass m and velocity v is m times v, and Newton's second law states that the rate of change of linear momentum is the sum of the external forces acting on the body, which gives us that the sum of the forces f is equal to d dt of mv, and since the mass is constant, this is mass times acceleration. And this is Newton's second law. The sum of the external forces here shown as f1 and f2 equals mass times acceleration a. We could also write this in terms of components of the force and acceleration in normal and tangent components. And here we would have the tangent and normal components of the force, the tangent and normal components of the acceleration. And so Newton's second law would be that the sum of the tangent components, ft, equals m times at. And recall from our early analysis, this is m times the rate of change of the magnitude of the velocity. And similarly, the sum of the normal forces equals m times a n. And from our early, earlier analysis, a n was the magnitude of the velocity squared divided by rho, the radius of curvature of the motion. An alternative and, of course, entirely equivalent way of thinking of Newton's second law is to say that the sum of the external forces is balanced by ma, and so sigma f minus ma is equal to zero. Expressed this way, we call minus ma the inertial vector. In other words, we say that the inertial forces are in dynamic equilibrium with the total of the external forces. So this is simply another entirely equivalent way of thinking about Newton's second law. So either the sum of the external forces gives rise to acceleration, or the inertial forces are balanced by the external forces. So next time we'll go on and we'll talk about the application of Newton's second law of angular motion to uh, problems in angular dynamical systems.